And then when tax revenues come in because they delayed the reporting of taxes, there'll be another point in August. So I don't know if they're, you know, going to give us partial in May and then if the tax revenue comes in, get more in August. Um, which brings us to the uh, CFAD. So Kristen, that would be true. So there's gonna be some kind of document that comes out in May, mid-May, like a May revise. And then when the tax revenue comes in later, there'll be kind of an adjustment probably in August, mid-August or late August. I don't know what the timeline is. I haven't really heard anything in writing, but uh, from what I've heard from CCAE and on Kepke, and other people is that um, there will be something in August. But we still want to have our, our CFADs done by May 2nd. And so this is how that will roll out. We'll go ahead like business as usual with the CFADs. Then that mid-May, if there is an adjustment, like they take away the COLA or do something else, then we'll do a revised CFAD. But we'll keep the interagency agreement moving along so the K-12 fiscal agents then the county office fiscal agents and the direct funded members get their money uh, in the fall or no later than probably August, September. And then if there is an adjustment in August, like maybe we get more money because of all the federal money and the tax revenues or they make an adjustment, then we'll deal with that in August. But um, so we might have to do a couple of rounds of this. So be prepared. Uh, it probably won't be a um, quiet summer. It'll probably be a busy summer. Um, so that's why it's so important to get those CFADs in May 2nd. I've been working with all the direct funded agencies to um, tell me if any direct funded member is going to get less than the uh, prior year. So I can plan for that because um, we're trying to create the uh, interagency a spreadsheet that shows the um, funding for each uh, member agency uh, going forward. So we need that information up front. So the other issue I wanted to bring up is um, carryover. So we've had some questions about, oh, you know, we're, we might not be running our program as at the same level we did. What are you going to do about carryover? Can I get an extension? And so this is kind of a sensitive time where um, if we have carryover, it might be difficult to uh, talk the legislature into giving us COLA if we have so much carryover. And so this is the time, if there is a need in your region, do that allocation amendment to move that money around uh, to where it's needed. So, um, and then that education code 84914, that is also important because that allows you to, if a member can't do what they did in the plan, because we have been hearing that some districts are doing hiring freezes or they're not allowing the adult school to do certain things with their, with their money. And so if that school or that college can't follow their plan, education code 84914 allows you to um, reduce or reallocate those funds to other members. So keep in mind that, and we do wanna put the um, funding to where it needs to go. So if a school or college is serving uh, adults and has a really good online component and there's a waiting list, we might wanna shift funds to that particular program if it's very successful and if other people are having trouble spending their money. So. Just keep that in mind. Let's pause there for a second to see if we have any questions. So Marianne says, when we submit our CFAD, how long before we receive an email back to confirm of approval or acceptance? I submitted mine already, uh, some sort of email to know it was even received. So uh, Marianne, we'll start looking at those on May 2nd. And then uh, upon May 2nd, because it's just me, so I haven't had time to, to look at those. And so um, I'll be reviewing those, setting up the interagency agreement. But remember, May 2nd, you might have to do a revision. 
And then if there's something in August, you might have to do a revision again or something. We'll have to see. So this is an unprecedented year. If they keep you know, changing the funding amount, so we have the governor's budget in January, then we have this May revise, then we have this August uh, date that might happen with tax revenues, so there could be another revision. So with all those, we might have to keep resetting our allocations. So it's all an unknown because the legislature hasn't met yet. And even from our lobbyists on the CCAE side, CAIA side, she's saying that um, the Senate and the uh, um, Assembly still aren't on the same page. So a lot to, to go through right now. Um, and so we'll kind of wait and see. So Jody says, uh, deadline for expending 1819 is December 2020, correct? Yes. So, you know, we're referring to 1819 carryover as well as 1920 carryover. So you could still reprogram that 1819 carryover because you have until the end of the year. The 1920 carryover uh, can be um, spent up until December 31st, 2021. So the following year. So Marianne, yeah, I would assume it's been received. So when I go start going through all the CFADs, if I notice that someone hasn't submitted one, I will contact you. Uh, otherwise, just assume that uh, we've received it because I'll be checking it off. Okay, so kind of went over a lot. What will be the deadline if we do get another May revise for the CFAD? So like last year when we did that, we usually um, gave you till June 30th. Um, so, you know, the sooner the better, but we know it's tough getting people together uh, over the summer or after school is closed, those kind of things. So um, we'll try to adjust. And then if there's some kind of August date, that'll be interesting as well. So we'll probably have to deal with these Possibly, if there's something that comes out in August, we might have to deal with that separately because we do want to get money out to the schools by August, September. So if they do an adjustment in August, um, like they give us more money, we'll probably have to do a separate process for that. But it'll probably be uh, similar to the CFAD, but we'll just have like a second interagency agreement or something like that. So it's all uncharted territory, unprecedented, and we'll see how this goes. Um, and so having multiple kind of reallocation or uh, revision dates is uh, not the norm. And so we'll, we'll play along and try to keep everybody abreast of uh, what's happening. Beth says, what is the CFAD date before the May revise? May 2nd. So the current CFAD is due May 2nd, no extensions, because we have to prepare for you know, maybe we'll get the COLA and then we want to get the interagency agreement going. If not, then we uh, are back to uh, revision and then June 30th. But all this is kind of unknown because um, we're kind of waiting for the legislature to get together. Uh, okay. All right. And revisions is to also have to be approved by board and public meetings. Unfortunately, yeah, because it is a uh, consortia decision and you're reallocating or changing funding amounts. So that is kind of a public decision, uh, public meeting type scenario, unfortunately. But you can do it virtual. Um, follow those uh, contemporary guidance that was sent up by the governor. So any other questions? Uh, Kristen asks, clarification on Brown Act. I know it's up to local interpretation. When I reread it, it seems like it still requires a physical location, even if it's held virtual. Is that right? I would clear that with local legal counsel. I don't know if anybody else has a different read on that, what their local district has interpreted it. But we definitely, at the state level, we won't get into that. So it's really up to you know, whether you're a college legal counsel or a district, 
uh, how you want to run those meetings, and then whether the provisions are uh, how you're invoking the provision. So Marianne says there's a provision for emergencies that it can be virtual, and this is an emergency event. So. All right. So any other questions before I get into long term? So I know for long term, we're um, talking about looking at as soon as the 1819 data is ready, that we start releasing some statewide averages. And so we still haven't settled on what those state, statewide averages will look like, but it could be something like, I don't know, the number of enrolled individuals in your program in 1819 divided by the number of people in need. And uh, usually it's either limited English proficiency population is the greatest need or lack of high school diploma is the greatest need. So we could do some benchmarking to see what is that percentage of enrollment to uh, one of the greatest needs of our needs formula? Another thing we're looking at for statewide averages could be the number enrolled that get to 12 hours. What is that percentage? And then we could also look at, you know, the number of participants that are 12 hours or more, how many show an educational functioning level gain. And so what we do is we would, um, produce kind of statewide averages and then you could, and then we'd produce the averages for each consortia. And then you could see where the consortia aligns, whether you're above the statewide average or below, and that could inform your, your planning for, you know, future annual plan updates and your three-year planning going forward. Um, I think the state eventually wants to get into goal setting. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but possibly uh, next year, if we get these statewide averages off the ground, there could be some goal setting the following year. And then there could be some, uh, who knows, performance related in the next three year plan. But that's all kind of uh, depending on how our data looks, you know, what, what kind of um, data we're gonna look at. We can also look at, um, you know, who's, who's got carryover, what percentage of your current funds are being spent or things like that. So um, let's see. So I'll just pause there. So Kristen said, do we need to revise our current three-year plan and annual plans? So what you have to do every year, once you submit your three-year plan, Kristen, then the annual plan is an update for each year after that until you submit the next three-year plan. So when the three-year plan was submitted in 1920, you also had an annual plan. So in 2021, you'll just be doing an update to that annual plan. Um, it's optional if you wanted to update your three-year plan, but you don't have to, because that's only due every three years. But the annual plan is a way to kind of update that three-year plan and update what you're gonna do for the year if you wanted to. Really, all you have to do is submit your template for the annual plan and tell us what you're gonna be working on that year. And then the members go in and submit their plan based on that annual plan, which is based on the overall three-year plan. So Lonzi says, Neil, the following is a link that offers additional information regarding the interpretation of the Brown Act. Thank you, Lonzi. Uh, Peggy asks, Neil, is the annual plan template available or do we use last year's? So once you submit the CFAT, it'll allow you to start working in the annual plan template. And so it's the same as last year, but each annual plan template is based on your allocation for that year. So your 1920 annual plan is linked to your 1920 CFAD. So once you submit your 2021 uh, CFAD and it's uh, certified by your consortia, then you can start working on the annual plan uh, in NOVA for your consortia. And then your members, once that's approved, they can start working on their individual plan. Uh, Emma says, Neil, is it recommended that we have specific strategies to address distance learning for each member in the annual plan? Um, and the annual plan is due August 15th each year. So Emma, I don't know, that's, since it's for this coming year, I think you should address what you're going to be working on that year. It might be a little different than what your three-year plan 
laid out, but um, you know, it could still focus on those program areas. You might, your delivery methods might be a little different. Um, so that would be something to look at, I think, but I don't think you have to redo your whole three-year plan, but you should address maybe delivery of, uh, instruction and services, uh, those modalities in your updated three-year, uh, updated, excuse me, annual plan to August 15th. Uh, Lonzi says, when evaluating carryovers, will that be done by consortia or by member districts? Lonzi, what do you mean by evaluating carryover? Currently, we have, you know, you have a two-year target to spend down the funds. If you don't spend it down in two years, uh, you can do a corrective action plan in NOVA that'll give you an extra six months. So you'll have 30 months. Once that 30 months is over, we uh, have until Q2 of that following year to close it out. And so um, that's really kind of the state perspective. We have one year to allocate, and then you have uh, kind of two and a half years to spend it and close to six months to uh, close it out. So really a three year cycle there. So evaluating carryover, I mean, some people have bylaws that evaluate, uh, you know, Ed Code 84914 that deals with effectiveness. What does that mean? Um, so those are kind of things that I think would be per the bylaws because as far as carryover, as long as they're following their plan. Now, if they aren't following their plan, then you would go back to Ed Code 84914 because if they can't follow the plan or no longer wish to follow the plan or they're being ineffective following their plan, then that would be the part of the evaluation that we're seeing on the carryover. That's the only thing in um, ed code that we have right now that kind of evaluates carryover. But we have seen some consortia having um, updated bylaws that look at carryover at certain intervals and members have agreed you know, at 18 months or 20 months or 24 months to reallocate uh, carryover. So uh, unless you're following Ed Code 84914, um, you probably have to have some kind of local regional consortia bylaw that would evaluate your carryover. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for sharing. Uh, Kim said some districts will not release carryover until October. I'm not sure what it, you mean. I'm not sure what that means. So you have 30 months to spend it. So 18, 19, uh, the end date is December 31st. So if you're saying that a district's not going to release their 18, 19 carryover until October, what you could do and this is how it works in Nova, even if you released carryover in October, you could swap it out. So let's say you, a member can't spend these funds. So you do an allocation amendment and it goes to another member that has tons of expenditures. They're actually working on current year uh, spending. Um, when that allocation amendment comes in, it goes to that year and if there's any expenses there, it'll spend that down. So it's kind of first in, first out. So it kind of helps that consortia so they don't have to give it back to the general fund. If you do have members that are spending in the current year, it'll just first in, first out that funding. So even if you have to do it late in October or November, it'll still get spent down by that uh, cutoff date in December because you already have uh, current year expenditures sitting there that could be used to uh, spend down those old funds. I hope that makes sense. It's a little complicated, but. If you look at NOVA, that's kind of the way it works. Any update on the adult ed PAC recommendations to limit carryover? I'm not aware of, I know that CCAE mentioned something about the carryover, but I'm not, uh, I don't lobby or I'm not involved in those um, policy decisions. If it does get to uh, the legislature, then we'll be asked to oppose or support or stay neutral on it. So until that gets to us, I can't really comment on it, Kelly. 
Shannon says, if you don't have your carryover from your district, you can find your 1819 carryover in FIFO and NOVA. Granted, your NOVA information is correct. That's right. Or is that a question or is that a statement? I don't know. Veronica's, is she, oh, a statement, okay, great. I always defer to Veronica on uh, NOVA technical stuff. So, but Shannon's been working with Veronica a lot, so I would trust uh, Shannon's knowledge of NOVA, probably more so than mine. All right, so any other questions? Uh, those are things that we're kind of looking at but those timetables have been kind of upset. I mean, we're still looking at statewide averages and goal setting and those kind of things ramping up for, you know, in a couple of years to provide guidance to the next three year plan, which might include some kind of goal setting for related to performance or something. Um, but given the situation we're in, I don't know if that timetable is still kind of valid. But we do wanna, hopefully when we get out of this, provide a long runway to the next three year planning and it probably should look a little different. I know they wanna phase in, you know, kind of statewide averages and goal setting. So just be prepared for that. I know we'll take a big hit this quarter, quarter three and quarter four, as uh, students wrap up, new students don't come back uh, and our enrollments take a big hit. Um, so we'll have to deal with that as that data comes in. All right, so while we pause, I'll bring Veronica on. She wants to give some updates, unless anybody else has some um, things to discuss. You can feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you do wanna uh, share something, something that's going on or bring up a point or you could type it in the chat. Um, so uh, Veronica, let me answer. Thatcher's question, do you have any ideas on how statewide averages uh, and goal setting would work into allocation and funding? We haven't even talked about that yet. I think the statewide averages and goal setting are for planning. We haven't had any discussion of how that would work into allocations and funding. I think until we perfect our data collecting or data collection, uh, we're still very leery of tying that to allocations and funding, just because we still are uncovering uh, many uh, issues with the um, coding on the college side, some of the outcomes on the um, K-12 side, you know, with uh, GD, high set, those kind of things. So with that, I'll bring in um, Veronica and she'll talk to you a little bit about some other things we have going on. Thank you, Neil. Um, so the first thing that I would like to address is our new COVID-19 Google group. And so as we have been, as Neil mentioned, we have been hosting the CAEP regional network meeting. We have hosted two thus far and we have another four to go over the next two weeks. And so we were, um, kind of thinking, well, what are some other opportunities for CAP consortia to engage with one another on a more real-time basis versus waiting for the regional networking meeting? Or if a consortium lead that's way upstate had a question and maybe someone in the San Diego area would be able to help them, then that's a way for us to bridge that connection. So we have developed a Google group that we will be launching um, between today and early Monday morning. And so we will be sending invitations to all consortium leads, um, directors, co-directors, uh, co-chairs, and all members as an opportunity to engage. However, we don't wanna stop the engagement from there. We would like to pass this information along to instructors, support staff, counselors, transition specialists, anyone who has been actively working with um, 
districts and agencies as well as students to navigate COVID-19 and have some very valuable resources that could be shared as well as any challenges that may be arising as you are still going through this process and we also want to celebrate successes so if you have you know a tool that has been really effective and really helpful in connecting with students and keeping them engaged in the learning process we'd like to know about those resources as well so like I said it's just another opportunity for everyone to connect with one another and for um, questions and answers to be passed along. Um, like I said, we want to keep everyone engaged as much as possible. So that's one thing. Um, so like I said, invitations will be sent to consortium leads and members via TAP. But then if you have other members within your consortium who you think would be an asset to this or who could really benefit from this tool, definitely feel free to pass the invitation along to them. The um, process would be they would have to request permission to join the group, but we would definitely grant them permission in order to participate. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing on the agenda um, talked about the CEP update report. So in turn, we will be developing a bi-monthly CAP report to kind of document the successes, challenges, and opportunities that have come about, as well as um, providing point-in-time reference to the COVID critical event survey so that um, that information could, so that you all know what's going on across the state as it relates to that, and then other tools and resources that are available. Again, just another opportunity for us to share all of the valuable resources that we are receiving so that everyone is on the same page and have all of the same information and resources. And um, OTAN and CASA's webinars. So I'm going to share my screen and take you to the events page where you can see all of the upcoming webinars that are available to you via the California Leadership Projects as well as CAP. And so on this page are all of the upcoming webinars. So as you can see today, CASA's and OTAN have been really busy and have been hosting webinars. Their last webinar finished at 11 o'clock this morning. So the next opportunity to engage with CASA's OTAN as well as TAP is on Monday. So we'll have Region 2 Bay Area CAP Regional Networking Meeting. It's designed for the Bay Area region. However, anyone from any part of the state can join if you'd like to, even if you participated in last week's or this week, excuse me, CAP Regional Network, Network Meeting. If you wanna engage with the people in the Bay Area, you are more than welcome to do so. So if you haven't registered yet, you can do that. Um, OTAN will be hosting an office hour on Monday at one o'clock. They also have a webinar at two o'clock on creating a learning module in Canvas. And then CASAS has the NRS performance goals using data to improve programs part three on Monday at 10 o'clock a.m. So always reference this page whenever you're looking for any opportunities to um, participate in any webinars provided by CAP or any of the California um, leadership projects. And you can kind of um, do a search by entity, so by sponsor. So let's say you don't want to navigate through everything that's on this page, you can select which entity you're looking for, and then their opportunities will be presented on this page and you are able to access and register for those webinars. So definitely take advantage of that. And then the last thing on the agenda, oh, that was the last thing that I had to share with everyone. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out and then also be on the lookout for invitations to join the Google group. We hope that everyone finds that as a valuable tool and a way to engage with one another on a regular basis. If anyone have any other tools or resources that you think would be useful for CAP, definitely feel free to pass that information along and we will, um, we will explore those those opportunities that are available. And that's all that I have, Neil. All right, thanks, Veronica. And then um, Costas has been responding to some of the questions in the chat about, you know, the pre and post testing pilots. There's some webinars coming up uh, on ELC, April 30th, and then May 4th, pre and post testing. And you probably showed those when you went over the um, events page. And so that would be the place to check. So there's a lot of good comments in the chat. Veronica, did you cover that, what we're thinking about doing with all the information that we're collecting from the Google groups? 
I had to mute for a little bit. Oh yeah, no worries. Yes, I announced that we will be developing that report that will be shared with everyone and it will be on a bi-monthly basis. Yeah, we're hoping to share like successes because we know if you're caught in the middle of this stuff, sometimes it's nice to hear how other people are trying to succeed, some innovation that are going on. Even if it's a small program, still it'd be, it's, it's gonna be nice to share that kind of information because there are people working really hard out there. And we know there are other issues going on out there, you know, equipment issues and connectivity issues and things like that. And their anxiety about uh, funding and things like that. So we'll do these kind of bi-weekly updates to keep you guys abreast of what's happening around the, uh, the state. Uh, if there's pockets of inspiration going on, we'll put that in there too. Um, if we can get some survey uh, information from that um, survey that OTAN is um, collecting information from the CDE one. We'll share that as well. And then if CASAS gets any student data at the end of this month, we'll pass that along too to show, you know, what are the levels at, where we're at. So we'll try to keep you as much informed as possible. So when you do have these phone calls, with your public officials or local leadership that you're well informed about what's going on uh, and you can support uh, the CAPE program and your adult ed program locally as well. So um, let's go see if there's any questions here. I think Jay has answered a few, but Karen says, this is probably for uh, Veronica, Veronica, is there a link to the Google group from the CAPE website? Oh, okay, and I guess you answered it. So you said, not yet, we have launched, we haven't launched it yet. It'll be on the website as well as in next week's newsletter. Okay, great. So watch out for that. We'll try to keep the momentum going. We have two um, regional meetings next week. Uh, and then two after that, and we'll continue to plug away. And so far we, you know, we're hearing kind of a consistent theme. You know, some programs are back online. Students are coming back, not necessarily, you know, full house, but students are coming back. Uh, teachers are working uh, miracles. There's some innovation on, you know, using hotspots and uh, Rachel and these other kind of uh, platforms that OTAN talks about, some software uh, programs um, for online learning work better than others. Some to be, some seem to be more successful. So we'll continue to provide that information to you as it becomes available, and then we'll continue giving you opportunities to share with each other, um, either through regional meetings or on these Friday calls. So feel free, to, if you have something to share, you can always share it in the chat or unmute yourself and uh, share verbally if you, will, if you wish. Okay. So feel free to ask um, anything about NOVA because you do have the CFAD coming up or the annual plan in August. Or if you have a top stroke question, Jay's on the on the uh, line today. You know, you have your April 30th Q3 due. So um, so Peggy says it won't. Well, Veronica will make sure you get unmuted, Peggy. Uh, and so any other questions like that? Oh, there we go. Yeah, hi, this is Peggy from the North Santa Clara County Consortium. Um, you know, first of all, I just wanna say thanks to CASAS for all of their hard work and thanks to Jay for always being so responsive. Um, I think there's a huge camp of us that are, you know, the Jay fan club. So that's the first thing I wanna say. Um, but secondly, I'm, I'm disappointed that Carolyn wasn't able to make it today and I know she's very busy, but uh, one of the things in the CASAS remote testing webinar that became very clear was that it is up to the state whether they want to uh, allow flexibility for testing. Um, and I know for us, 
uh, in our consortium, there are a lot of concerns about just being able to ramp up and get this done in the next, you know, three to four weeks because our school is ending. Um, some of the issues that are presented because of, um, you know, it's time intensive or there are equity issues around, you know, equipment and uh, the limited number of staff. And, you know, Costas has done a really good job of trying to put together a package to go with remote testing. And so this is absolutely nothing against, you know, what they're saying. But uh, I guess I'm just wondering about how we might go about engaging um, Carolyn and others at the state level uh, in conversation about maybe, you know, using the flexibility for the spring, but then using the summer to shift and get ready for remote testing in the fall. Um, so just wondering if there's any thoughts around that. Peggy, um, I think those kind of conversations probably uh, CDE is already having. I'm not sure if they're shared publicly and Costas is probably involved in those. I don't know if Jay can unmute himself to come on to see if, you know, any kind of update on that, but I'm, I'm sure they're waiting for the pilot results to kind of have those kind of conversations. So, so the, so I think I'm unmuted, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so specifically you're wondering about how the whole pilot is going to affect policy or is there something else I'm kind of missing here? Well, I think it's more about that. I think, you know, the pilot is great. I just think in terms of the time frame for us, Jay, it's really hard to even envision how we would bring that about to kind of give post testing in part because a, a lot of the agencies don't have a ton of people who are already certified to do the cost of testing and they're the ones that have to then get the remote testing right. but also just equipment issues uh cell phone issues you know so it's more about that we just don't like this is the wave of the future we know that and i appreciate all cost is doing it's just I think to get it done in the next three to four weeks is like, I can't even okay. fathom that. I, okay, so I see where you're on. going. Obviously, I definitely have way short of any definitive answer, but you're on the right track that I think that that does kind of relate to the policy side. I think the best way to present it is that those workshops we referenced on April 30th, May 4th, they will be CASAS and CDE. So part of okay. it will be us at CASAS describing that pilot like we did in our CASAS webinar a couple days ago, but some of it will be Carol in there talking about, you know, how that will affect policy. It's hard to really answer because I've got to say, I don't know necessarily what that final policy answer is going to be. And all of those questions you asked depend very heavily on that policy. If the policy is, yeah, payment points are one way, well, then some of these things might be a big issue. If we know that's not an issue, well, then maybe it isn't. I don't know what the answer is, but I've got to say there's a huge swing there on how, how that will be affected depending on what that final policy answer is. Okay, so the 30th and May 4th, that sounds like a... a great kind of avenue I, to have the conversations then i think so yes and to be clear i think i put it in chat but the one on the 30th is going to be related to el civic so it will talk about co-ops and the set the one on may 4th will talk about pre and post testing gotcha great and so just to clarify one other thing because somewhere in the chat they talked about a neil fan club so number of us have been in that club since the Perkins day. So Neil, don't worry. We still got your club going too. So, oh, just so you know. That's, that's kind of like one of those senior citizen clubs, huh? Hey, you know what? I Jay's, in that category. Jay's, I think, yeah, I it know, meets every day at 4.15 p.m., right? <laughs> yeah, for the Blue Plate special. Yeah. Jay's significantly nice. younger than me, so obviously his fans are significantly younger than my fan clubs. <laughs> <laughs> So Jay, there, there, there have been uh, a lot of comments uh, echoing Peggy's concerns. So I don't know if there's anything you can respond to 
in that. I think the answer I gave you is probably the best because I really, I mean, I understand all those questions, but I got to say the answers are wildly different depending on what that final policy is. So there's not like an answer I can give you where it will be about like this. It will literally be, well, if the policy is one way, then there might be some things we really need to keep in mind. If it's the other way, then it might be lower stakes and not quite as urgent. Right, and you know, one thing, Neil, that I can say is I know Carolyn, every time she's jumped on, she said she wants to hear from the field. So I know she's very open and she takes in all the ideas that people give her. So I think Jay's solution of the 30th and the 4th is kind of the, the medium or venue for, for having conversation and, and giving feedback. I think that sounds great. So that's a good plan and we can move forward with that. And, you know, we're all trying to figure it out together, right? Hashtag all in this together. So, yeah. All right, and then um, let's see. So, Jay, is there plenty of room on those webinars that are I coming up? I think so. The one that we did, we hosted, we thought that we would be fine just hosting it ourselves. We have a capacity of 300, obviously. Uh, you know, we, we, we underestimated our own popularity. Because of what happened the other day, we're moving these to OTAN, which I believe if they're there, they can verify, but I think it's a thousand that they have capacity. So it's possible it could get overloaded, but the bar will be way higher before we have to start worrying about it with OTAN hosting. Okay. And I did forget to bring my Slurpee cup today. Apologies. My 25, 30 year old plastic Slurpee cup, which is probably not, I shouldn't be drinking out of, but I apologize for not showing up with my cup today. So um let's see if there's anything else so martha says remote testing presents huge challenges for esl particularly low levels of esl it takes roughly two and a half hours to do the appraisal and testing imagine testing 700 this way okay and then adele says rural districts will be disproportionately affected by the needs to do remote testing digital divide causes unequal access and then Aminor Kelly says, remote access combined with ESL low level, a real challenge. Okay, so all good stuff. And we have those upcoming webinars. So, uh, and then when we do do the regional meetings, like Peggy said, Carolyn's usually on those. So she is hearing what you're talking about. So the Bay Area one, hopefully the CDE will have a uh, representation on that one for I think it's Tuesday and uh, we can have those kind of discussions there as well. All right. So uh, let's see. And Karen said, we're all in this together. Has to be equitable. So Jay, Julie says, will, uh, will the option be available for fall pre-testing? And I think you said that's the plan, right? Right. I mean, the, the, uh, Mechanically, of course, it will be available. It's programmed in, so you'll be able to mark it when you want. I guess that one is, even for right now, we have it in TE. We're suggesting everybody leave it blank for the short term because we're still kind of developing a statewide policy for when to mark it. There's lots of competing ideas on what situation should trigger that. So we kind of feel like we need to get together with CDE and have a uniform policy for what you're talking about in the fall, I see it as totally possible, but I see that also as kind of folding into, you know, the statewide policy on, you know, what's going to be going on there August, September. Right. And then uh, from Kelly, are there any thoughts for allowing other types of MSGs besides EFLs? And Jay covered, didn't we cover that kind of in a webinar? A few weeks ago, right, Jay, we talked about yeah. high school diploma can be an EFL, your workforce prep, passage of an exam can be an EFL, your training milestones can be EFLs. Uh, what other areas did you talk about that could be? You know, we talked about high school credits. Yeah. You know, potential, I mean, potentially some of the, the things coming up in these webinars could could be ways to track informal, you know, yeah. MSGs and, as well. And then Jay, didn't I'm hesitant talk, to go too far with it though until after the webinars. 
Yeah. And then I think we're going to have a discussion on ESL, possibly looking at co-op completions as a measure of student progress. Is that something that we're going to be looking at? I, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, depending on how things work out, I mean, that's a good example of what we can probably get into more after we get these webinars and reconcile okay. what we're doing with policy and so on. Okay, so it sounds like Jay is not comfortable, ready to speculate before we have the webinars because it probably CDE is going to be leading the policy charge on that. So that's a good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> but for ESL, I think they are looking at, you know, different aspects of the, uh, you know, if, if it's difficult to do the pre and post testing, are there other ways? And there are some suggestions out there and some options. We'll see uh, what CD has to say on that. So um, stay tuned for that. Uh, but on the CTE side, you do have, you know, your passage of an exam, your training milestone, those kind of things. Um, Jay, could you use transition to post-secondary as a measurable skill gain? Is that something the feds would That's allow? Potentially on table four, yeah, there's a, I mean, I'll just say there's a lot of details I'm probably leaving out here, but the short answer is the same outcomes we use on the CAPE summary side to record post-secondary outcomes are the outcomes that get recorded in the long run on table four. It's not a big part of table four. It's, there's not like a special area where you see it, it kind of gets lumped in with you know the regular EFL gains you know for federal reporting but right. technically there is a way now under WIOA where post-secondary does get counted on the uh, table four item count so yes it will not help for payment points but it will potentially help for our NRS table four if you have students that obtain post-secondary. Okay so we're not really having a WIOA 2 pay point discussion today, but if you're looking at the me metrics from the CAPE perspective, there are a lot of avenues you could um, use to report that student progress. And we'll continue exploring that. And like Jay said, those upcoming webinars will kind of have the definitive discussion with CDE on the on the webinar to talk about that as, as it connects back to we owe it too. And since our metrics align with basically the federal metrics, We'll probably follow suit on that as well, just so we can stay aligned with it. Okay, a lot of good discussion today. But uh, Veronica, how much time do we have left? About seven minutes. Okay. So, is there anything anybody else as we wrap up or summarize that? you want myself or Veronica or Jay to restate that wasn't clear or uh, information you need to know going forward for next week. Um, like I said, stay tuned for the, when the legislature gets back in session, May 4th, we're looking for maybe some type of revision or update to the budget by that second week of May. I don't know what that's going to look like. But we'll be, everyone will have eyes on that second week of May to see how that's going to impact us, if it impacts us at all. Um, and then that August date when tax revenues come in will probably be another uh, revision or I don't know if that's when the state budget is going to be passed or so that's all kind of unknown. So we'll continue to share as soon as we hear about it. Uh, either on our uh, Friday call or our Wednesday newsletter or network meeting. So you have various uh, communication channels that we'll be using at least twice a week, uh, sometimes more if you're joining on webinars to keep you up to date and uh, in the know. So uh, you are not blindsided by things. And then if you hear stuff at the local level, like a district's not allowing you to spend your funding or if there's a hiring freeze or something went crazy, bless you, something went crazy you. in uh, your consortium meeting, always please keep us up to date on that because we like to know what's going on. And we'd like to help if possible. So with that, I'm not seeing any more comments. 
Veronica, did you have anything that uh, maybe you wanted to share in addition to what you already shared? Um, no, nothing in addition. I did post the CAP COVID-19 COVID page, and then I'll also post um, the OTAN page, and that's a combination of OTAN, CASAS, and CalPRO and all of their resources in response to COVID-19. We are moving forward with the CAP Summit, so we will be announcing that next week. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, fingers crossed that we are able to hold it in October. But as of right now, we will be moving forward. So look out for information on registration, call for proposals, as well as exhibitor information coming out next week. Okay, so no, no, no stepping on cracks, no um, black cats, and we'll hope to have the summit in place in October. Uh, Jay, there was a question from Julie. Maybe we, you could be the last question here. Regarding policy, would CDE consider cost of scores from prior year to determine payment points while we I think what you're getting at, Julie, is there's a million little, there's a million kind of X's and O's, like, I mean, not a million, but a lot of those X's and O's sort of solutions on the table. I'm not sure what the final is going to be, but I'll just say there's a lot of X's and O's like that being considered at the moment. Okay, and then Sarah asked, should we be worried about... 712 district swiping adult ed funds. Well, uh, I was just going to type in. So they would need to pass some kind of legislation or change in statute. They couldn't just swipe it. They would have to have the legislation. So that's where, if you are involved in advocacy, we did a full court press, hopefully with our local officials, our leadership, to let them know, you know, these are restricted funds. We want to keep it that way. They're targeted to, you know, adult ed students in these seven program areas. Uh, approval for these funds have to go through the consortia. And so if we can't follow the plan that was approved by the consortia, we risk getting reallocated. So if your district isn't allowing you to follow the plan because they're creating a higher hiring freeze or creating uh, barriers for you to jump over, um, that will prevent you from following your plan, you're at risk to get your funds reallocated or reduced because you're not following your plan per Ed Code 84914. So you can use that in your meetings with your district because right now nothing has been passed in legislation or a change in statute that allows them access to these funds. And if they are restricting you access to spending these funds, then you have a um, possible risk of getting it reallocated to another member in your region. So just keep that in mind. So hopefully that was a long answer to Sarah's short question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so Corley says, I'd like to learn more about what other, oh, so, so Corley, we have set up I'm, thank, I'm glad you brought this up. So we have created a K-12 adult and a county office jail ed network meeting because there wasn't any information being shared statewide among our jail ed programs. And then we are connected with the college jail ed program. So there's a college jail ed networking program or group. And then now we have a K-12 adult county office jail ed network group. And so we're just starting this. We're going to have another network meeting in May, and then we're going to do it quarterly. We'll bring the college in as needed and uh, with their programs as well. So we'll keep you in the loop as far as inmate programs. If you're interested, just um, contact TAP, and we will put you on the, the mailing list. And if anybody else is interested that hasn't already been contacted, because I sent out an email to about 41 uh, people that are going to be in the K-12 County Office uh, Jail Ed Network. If you didn't get that, then please contact TAP and we will add you to the list. Okay, let's see. I got to scroll down here. Uh, fantastic networking. Oh, yeah. So 
some of the people that were on that here. So that's great. All right. We have two members working in our county jail. So Kristen, if you did want to join up, and Laura says we feel like we are in a jail. So this would be the physical jail, not your own personal mental jail that the virus has put us all in. Uh, but uh, appreciate heartfelt uh, uh, sympathy goes out to Laura and everybody else that feels like that. Uh, I'll let Veronica close out because she does such a wonderful job and, and Holly and Veronica help us out day to day, always keeping us on the straight and narrow, keeps me out of the jail ed program. Uh, so I thank them for that. And go ahead, take it away, Veronica. Thank you, Neil. Um, and I also, I put a lot of links in there to various webinars that are upcoming, the COVID-19 resource pages we have set up, as well as I wanted to remind everyone to please be sure to read the weekly newsletters. We do include a lot of great information in there, as well as links to reports and publications that will assist you during COVID-19 and beyond. So definitely pay attention to those. There's a lot of great information in there. Um, so I just wanted to put that reminder out there. But again, thank you all very much for your participation this afternoon. We will be back on Monday with the Bay Area Regional Network meeting. So again, if you would like to participate, please be sure to register and find a while find out about all of the wonderful things that are going on in the Bay Area. And remember the regional network meetings is less of a presentation, but more of an engagement between members, um, letting everyone know exactly what's going on in their area. So definitely be sure to tune in um, for that. And we will be back next week for another CAP office hour. So thank you all very much and have a great afternoon. <laughs>